that's so degrading. <laughs> okay, good morning and welcome everyone. It is February 26th, 2024. Welcome to our nine o'clock strategic planning meeting. Um, we have Commissioner Gordon, Commissioner Waldrop, Commissioner Cuny in person. Uh, Commissioner Kearns is on Zoom, and I believe Commissioner French is not going to be able to join us this morning, but will be with us tomorrow. So we will go ahead and get started for our strategic planning meeting, um, and we're starting off with Under Sheriff Kevin Ritchie and Lieutenant Justin Elliott. Thank you for coming and uh, talking to us about the real time real time crime Let <laughs> me say that slow. But. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> well good morning. Uh, so we want to do. Uh, we, we've been working on this project now for over a year and, and uh, I think it's time we come in and start giving kind of regular updates on the progress. Um, you know, it's, it's involving a lot of funding that we got from the governor, from the feds, and just kind of what, see what's going on or what the capabilities of it are and, and where we're at in the process. Um, so Justin's going to have a, a, a presentation for you. I just, when you're, when you're watching this, I, I want to I want to really emphasize the fact that this, it's been going on for about 14 months now. Just when it really just started. We're starting to, we're starting to capture the uh, impacts and outcomes, but you know, this started way back two years ago with the initial plan. So just bear in mind that this is probably as it sits right now at about 15 to 25 percent capacity of, you know, up to where it's, you know, when it gets to 100 percent of our capabilities, we're at about, I don't know, we're down in that range, the tw low 20 percent, um, you know, at the most. And just, when you see the the things that we've been able to accomplish with just the very little that we're doing right now, um, it, 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 I think you're going to be amazed at what we're going to be able to do with it when it is in the 50 percent, 75 percent, 90 percent capacity. So uh, Justin will show you a bunch of stats and kind of what what's going on. He'll have some uh, examples of some uh, some cases we've worked with it and and what the results were. So um, I just want to make sure you guys just understand it's this is we're very very low functioning right now. So and it's pretty amazing what we're with a, such a low function. So, Justin? Great. Yeah, so with that being said, what you're going to see is we've been starting to layer technology in, in a manner that we've been able to uh, for timelines with personnel. And we're taking on this project with the only additional personnel at this point is uh, our new IT manager for the Real Time Crime Center, Brad Cushman, who came from County IT. And uh, so, on top of that, all of this has been on the shoulders of those, those of us in our unit who uh, already have full time jobs. So we're, as we work towards creating these new positions, uh, and we've got some new people coming on probably in April, uh, two to three more employees in the Real-Time Crime Center plus uh, construction, and then our uh, project manager. Uh, keeping that in mind is, it's not that we build it all, we press the button and we start. You know, it's, it was, we're kind of learning as we go a little bit. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So. Just identifying for everybody what's in our mind is, is our stakeholders. This is a very big overview. Uh, we've got the, obviously you guys, the commissioners, all the different councils within uh, the county <clears throat> and uh, legislature overall. Law enforcement, law enforcement agencies, our agency, partner agencies that we are interacting with and either trying to share information, trying to bring uh, their data in. When I say layered technology, uh, you know, we can't do all this just with license plate readers, but it's very critical. Uh, we take investigative uh, software and processes. We take uh, live video. We take investigative software that is uh, can break down video, and we layer that to create the best effective way uh, within the law to uh, have a good outcome and increase our effectiveness with the sheriff's office and regionally. Uh, so again, the public, we have a big campaign right now. We're trying to identify like a group that is putting out regular information to the public regarding stats, our success stories, and we are just. There's so much we could share, we're not getting it all out. You probably see some of the uh, uh, of the press releases we've shared, uh, which I'll touch on, because just since I, we put this together, there's two significant ones just in the last probably three or four days. Uh, and, and when I say academics, uh, we've been approached by WSU uh, to embark on a, or they have some funding through state bills for uh, use of force uh, analysis, I think, and uh, through PhD, PhD candidates. And they currently have an offer on the table to for us to be one of the first agencies to have uh, embarked on a real-time crime center in the Northwest and then actually have, um, I guess, research-based um, evaluation of the outcomes versus just our opinion and what we're sharing. Uh, but that's also not in our, in our budget right now. And there's, you know, the funding for that PhD candidate to be on site for almost two years 
but these are things that are in our sphere that we're looking at. How can we best show objective data um, and success of meeting the goals that we put in that first executive summary uh, when embarking on this project? So, next slide. <clears throat> so a brief overview of some of the projects that we're, when I say projects, we've probably got, I don't know, 30, but we have to, you can go to the next one. The, uh, we have to identify, um, you know, what's, what's kind of on the front burner for us. So we currently have only 39 LPRs for the Sheriff's Office, but we also partner with the other agencies like Airway Heights, Liberty Lake, and we're waiting for some installations that we've been held back for some Washington State L&I electrical uh, permitting requirements that have slowed us down. Uh, but I mean, over a year ago, we ordered these cameras, which you guys approved, and then we'll end up getting the bill for those. But so the positive is the 39 cameras that are there, we are using, we don't pay until we get the last one in the ground. Uh, and then the operating system, uh, to touch on that again, this is really our dashboard, taking all the different siloed data that we have into one common operational picture for not only the real-time crime center, but dispatch and for our officers in the field, they can access live video, which I'll show you some snippets here in a little bit on that <clears throat> mapping system. And then we can integrate it with all of our county, ArcGIS. Uh, and honestly, as we keep going, there's, there's capabilities we haven't even seen yet until we get people sitting there actively doing it and be able to test test this in the real world. <laughs> uh, and then the Sentinel program that was launched, that's the website where uh, citizens can either register their cameras similar to the VIP program, which is already in place, but also now uh, integrate their cameras, uh, like the private businesses uh, in key areas where we can get live access to their cameras in the real-time crime center if it's public-facing cameras. I was out all half of Saturday contacting businesses and getting some good uh, partnerships uh, because and for those of you that have good contacts in the community, which I assume you do, anybody that comes on between now and June, we can get them indefinite free access integration. After June, it's going to be an average of about $500 per month per business to connect. Uh, so until then, uh, we've been driving around looking at places that have cameras that like face the street or high crime areas saying, hey, partner with us for free right now uh, and, and give us better access throughout the county. So is there a way to uh, work with, so are you working, is, are you looking for businesses inside the city of Spokane as well? Is it, or just outside the, the city? We are welcoming all businesses within the county, within the okay. city. The entire uh, county. Okay. That's yeah. Right. Yes. So have we talked to the Valley Chamber to get that out, um, information out, because they would be a key place. And then I got a lunch with GSI today, so I'm happy to, if you give me more information. Is that Greater Spokane? Yeah, okay. if, you know, to get it out, because that's a great way for them to put it out on their newsletter to businesses. That's a good idea. Um, and to answer your first question, yes, we did uh, front load the chamber with uh, flyers to go out to new businesses. <clears throat> we're trying to get more flyers from Flock because we're sending somebody out, and I, like, ran out of all the cards I had. Uh, but it, it's one of those things on our shoulders is an added duty. We're trying to do the community outreach. We're going to embark with Scope. Uh, and I just contacted Chris Conway with Scope on Saturday. And we're coming up with some kind of left and right parameters for what they can uh, advertise. You know, we're not interested in getting like people's ring cameras on their porch and getting like private areas. We, we're looking for really, it's a win-win and a community facing area, even if it gets a roadway, but also helps if they're getting responses. So we can try to get you some more materials. Uh, and we're trying to get more printed and some sort of kind of just shared message. Because uh, what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll actually put a, what's called a gateway device at this, and it just pushes that specific feed to the cloud. And a business can say, I just want you to have these two cameras, not all the rest. Okay. It's, it's a lot at once, and we're trying to get that out so we can right. share it. So. No, and, and I'm sure that it's hard if you're getting a whole bunch of people calling you back and wanting to figure out how to do it, too. So I Dustin Bonsgard, which is one of the, who's one of those critical uh, analysts in this project, uh, I'll either bring some over or we'll have him as a contact. Uh, in the next couple weeks, he'll be out. But we have some flyers that we can drop off that maybe you can start that. It's a QR code and, a, and the website. Okay. So to finish on that, Spokane Sentinel website is connected to the Sheriff's Office website. So anybody can go to Real Time Crime Center and link right to it. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Drone Sense was a purchase from a while back. This has been a huge success. So all the, uh, I would say we get like daily, mm -hmm. every time they launch a drone, officers, command staff, um, Real-time crime center, uh, dispatch all have the ability to see the live drone feed of the you know of the, of the scene, uh, the business, the home, the, the area, 
and also it's it's for the first time we're having live even on our phones uh, our helicopters camera is also in there as well as the uh, edu robots so this has been uh, a huge success and it's going to be just a daily situational awareness for our crime center brief cam it i'll show you a clip here in a moment um, it's saving us hundreds of hours of work. In fact, we're, we're finding evidence we never would have looked for because it, it has just been too time intensive and manpower intensive. Uh, and we're still working on the new VMS milestone with brief cam becomes just like a real powerful assistance to our investigations in our real time uh, and also connecting in other cameras. So that is brief cam. So brief cam was of the many pr uh, programs that we brought before you over the last <laughs> year and a half. Just yeah. a reminder. Yes. <laughs> Is, I no, like it's an acronym I have, that I don't know. That the... I have trouble keeping up with this stuff. It's, it's moving fast. So BriefCam is an investigative software. They used it during the, uh, the Boston bombings to take hundreds and hundreds of video feeds and identify specific uh, areas. And, and as you'll see here in a moment, uh, among other things, you can you know, draw a square over part of a video of maybe a fence or a gate and search dozens and dozens of hours and just pick up somebody or a vehicle coming through that gate almost momentarily instead of spending the, all those hours scanning that video. In addition to that, it can give us alerts so we can load uh, certain uh, either street cameras or covert cameras and we can say, hey, we're looking for a homicide suspect in a red pickup. And as soon as a red pickup hits that camera, brief cam recognizes it and then sends us a text or, a, or an email. Okay. Thank you. Just many things it does we haven't figured out probably. So here's, this is, this is staged. Uh, it's not an actual crime is what I mean. This is one of our uh, third party community partner videos at, at Car Wash Plaza. And so the analyst drew that kind of, I would say a rectangle, polygon, whatever you call it, uh, right there. And so it's just going to identify within an hour's time all the vehicles that came through there. Uh, and you'll see a time attached to each of them. Go ahead. And you play it. So it would take you an hour to view all these vehicles coming through, or you could just see them all here with the timestamp. Slowing down. So you would see probably another six or eight cars in there coming through. If we're looking for a specific vehicle or subject, it's, you know, okay, there it is. And we're moving a lot quicker through the investigation. Maybe we can clear cases quicker. Maybe we can exonerate somebody. Hey, you know, uh, they weren't actually at the scene of the crime. They were here. They said, hey, I was at the car wash. And we pull up the brief cam and we can find that out really quick. And it just helps focus our investigations to get more accuracy. I think everybody gets the idea. You can move on. <clears throat> Milestone, which I spoke about, is the new video management system. Uh, we were partnering or sharing uh, airship with the city of Spokane, which uh, for the amount of uh, video feeds and analytics we're bringing in, it wasn't meeting our needs. This was uh, a huge step for us. Uh, so uh, Deer Park, uh, Liberty Lake, and, and I, I need to contact Airway Heights. Uh, we've already got a partnership in, in the motion with Deer Park where they can connect their video to us, either through Milestone or straight to Flock through the Gateway partnership. Uh, and we can have parks cameras, city hall cameras awareness um, from those partners. But uh, any of our other, like our new training center, the Valley Precinct, we bring that into Milestone. We can also set recording. So, hey, we only want this one to record an hour or not at all. And hey, this is a really important camera, maybe here at the courthouse that we want to, from the campus, and we want to record a week, you know, and be able to go back and investigate it to react to that. Milestone gives us the ability to do that and a myriad of other type of capabilities. So this is working well. It's just on, it's a big lift for us to uh, integrate. All right, I'm trying to get this going. So I talked about the public safety network. Uh, that was, that's the third party, that's the Sentinel website um, and the temporary ability to do this for free until June that we're trying to move quickly on. Yes, sir. Uh, so on that network, you're looking for businesses and third parties all over. Uh, if there was uh, a business in the city that had a camera and they had a problem or something, how would that kind of connect with you guys? Would you be forwarding information to city police, I assume, or? Sure Help me understand the scope of uh, 
So any Having business in the city can yeah. connect in the same fashion as a third party. And their agreement is with Flock, and we were able to see the video. So for the understanding of this project, think about the real-time crime center as a voyeur. We don't really maintain any video, anything that's identified as evidence is automatically put into our evidence system. But we're able to have a situational awareness to tap in and see this stuff in real time based on policy and the type of crime that's involved. So, you know, we had reached out to, is it, uh, it's not OSA, but something, it's the Downtown uh, Business Association. Owners yeah. Association. Boma. And BOMA, mm -hmm. correct. <clears throat> and sometimes we get people engaged right away and sometimes we don't get calls back. We're kind of in the non-call back right now, but we're, we are reaching out individually like, if you want to do this, especially when it's a association group like that, it gives us the ability to connect on a larger scale. Uh, but we're open to any of that. We're just trying to budget our time and effort with the limited staff we have to really critical locations. So to answer your question, we, we have the ability with Flock right now that they have a project manager that we can get anybody online uh, to have that access. City police don't have don't have a real-time crime center, right? No. So they wouldn't be able to view whatever the video footage was unless we sent it to them, is that? Yeah, I mean, I think to answer your question, if, if they were part of this and yeah. if we did observe crimes, or you, we, would, we would forward the case yeah. again. They would, they would have to work it. You know, yeah. unless, it, unless it ties into a case that, that affects right. the county or, or the valley or something like that. It would be like and we have ways of sharing the real-time video feeds with them as well through different uh, user group uh, agreements. And, and they're still slowly going through their uh, contract uh, process with Flock. I think we're just waiting for them to sign that, and then everybody in their agency gets a login, and they can get live feeds just as we do. Okay. So we call this our new cows. I don't have a picture yet. I'll hopefully get it next go around. But the cow is the camera on wheels. This is something that during during my travels on other real time crime centers. This one was in Central California. Uh, they're taking decommissioned marked patrol cars. We're revamping them with with solar with uh, batteries, we put a boom through the roof. We have an active camera and an LPR. We can park those at events, uh, at uh, known crime areas, and have real-time uh, video, and just have the ability to move that around. Uh, if we were to have one of those fancy trailers that you've seen with the big boom and the flashy lights, those are about sixty to $70,000 just to buy those. Uh, <clears throat> and you have to hook them up to a car, and you gotta move them. These patrol cars have a deterrence factor you can park them in the parking lot at walmart if you need to wherever we need to have ready access uh, and it really after all said and done it, it only probably impacts our budget about thirteen thousand dollars per vehicle so we're, we've got two of these in process we hope to get another two and we're trying to talk the valley into uh, funding a couple of, uh, of the, the blue cars in the valley Uh, our radar trailers, uh, Chris is probably aware of our issues with the radar trailer company and, and those things staying powered in the field. We've got some, trying to get them to refund some money so that we can convert these over to Flock uh, with the same LPR system. Uh, we're going to be able to do this at a pretty uh, affordable rate. And so this is a big project as well as basically revamping uh, these, uh, these trailers we already have with our current equipment. It's an example of just many different uh, technology projects we have. And we don't have like a an assigned tech person that does this. This is all analysts and the IT manager learning new skills to be able to put this stuff together with our garage. And we're kind of doing this on the fly with what we have available. Highway 2 in Hayford has had Neology LPR for several years now. Uh, but those cameras go down and we don't have a built-in maintenance budget. And each time they go down, it's about a $15,000 hit to us that we're not anticipating. So we are uh, using our real-time crime center funds at one of the most critical locations and one of the few state highway agreement MOU contract locations we have. Uh, and partnering with uh, City of Airway Heights, because this is in the City of Airway Heights, uh, we're going to upgrade this intersection in every direction. Uh, and the camera you see on the picture there, that's a Falcon Flex. These are the subscription ones. Because we have such skilled individuals and uh, that are learning this camera process, we're able now to purchase what's called an Axis Q1700. I'm sure that's going to make an impact. And it's, uh, it allows us to buy a camera and install it um, for around $1,500, including the equipment. And then we only pay $1,500 a year for connecting that camera to Flock instead of $3,000 a year. 
So a significant savings for us to be able to employ our own cameras that we purchased. Um, and those also have the, they're called long range cameras, so they're able to go further out to about 300 feet. Next. Uh, same thing with I-90 and Barker, those cameras are needing upgrade uh, and also bring in to the flock system because the other system is much slower, harder to use for our people. And we hope to get both directions now. Right now we only have uh, westbound. We're hoping to, with the flock upgrade, we can get eastbound as well. And uh, we have a dire need for um, situational license plate reader uh, awareness out near the west state line. We were near being able to actually put uh, some flock cameras on the highway, but then there was a moratorium put on by the state uh, for LPR cameras. So that has been stuck in the mud, but we have some ability to um, install some cameras on county property that can. Okay. Yes, sir. Commissioner Kearns, go ahead. Uh, I, I just had a quick question. The cameras that we have around the courthouse, are those Flock or are those some other brand and are those all linked up to the Real Time Crime Center? Those are access cameras that are called PTZ or Pan Tilt Zoom. They're not license plate readers. Uh, the only license plate reader footprint we have in uh, campuses, I think we're still working with Ashley to get access to the parking uh, yeah. patrol. And that way we could flag a vehicle, especially if it's a threat subject on the campus, among other, uh, well, a lot of times we have wanted people who are dropping their significant others or friends off and, uh, or other awarenesses. Uh, or just general safety. But no, those cameras, they, they do come into the Real-Time Crime Center. Uh, and we're able, and once we have milestone established, they'll come directly in. And then we can uh, we can set uh, certain rules on them too. We can set a camera to these that we have now are just fixed in one position. So we have to manually turn them. We could program them to maybe pan every once in a while to get a uh, better video of campus. Uh, but yeah, there's five right now, sir, that are, uh, on the campus and they come into the real time crime center, but not LPR. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Definitely over the half day, I promise. <laughs> well over. <laughs> it's okay. Wait, Ashley, so d don't worry, you know, time today. I think kind of Scott and I talked about this. Um, I think we had you for even less time and I'm like, I think we need to expand it. And then Ashley's right after, so she she knows. So we're, we're there's so many tangents. Starts yeah. sneering at me. I'll be like, yeah. In fact, keep going. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'll try to keep us narrowed, but each sub each topic can be a whole meeting in itself. And uh, again, we're just trying to prioritize all the time of what gives us the best impact and outcome. We need to get these funds um, spent, you know, by the end of the year and, and things really planned out. So we're really in crunch time right now. Did you have a question? Thank you. I was wondering those uh, license plate reader cameras that you have at like Hafer, the one you had on the, have those generated any good information for cases that you've been working on? Oh, absolutely. And, and I would maybe just give us an example or. So specifically to the neology ones, they're not as well equipped to give direct alerts to dispatch and the officers. So a lot of times those are used to go back uh, by the investigative analysts and, and see when a vehicle's come through. I know there's dozen to say specifically Hayford I-90. I've got some wins here at the end, but they're primary from Flock. Uh, and when we turn those over, uh, the winds are gonna skyrocket because in the middle of the night, when, you, when we have a, a wanted subject or a missing persons or a suicidal subject, they're gonna be able to react right away. So the Flock is much more it gives you these like instant real, real notifications, yeah. but the other ones you have to actually like go back, like type in the license plate, see if you can find it. It's got a real time function, but it, it gets a lot of misreads. Okay. And for a long time, we were trying to get the company to stop giving us Southern Idaho hits. So we, we were just getting flooded with uh, what I would call a uh, crying wolf type of hits. Mm -hmm. And so then people become numb to the real hits because it gets so many negative ones. Right, right. Uh, one time, it was somebody had a plate entered that was all ones. It was a stolen vehicle, and our that company's camera like was constantly hitting on a picket fence it was sitting in front of. And so I would say accuracy, <laughs> false alarm. And, and Idaho ISP was calling us and like, can you please? You know, turn that one a different way. <laughs> so it, I would say it's more cumbersome, whereas the, the, the flock system, some companies have better cameras, equipment we're starting to find, but their their software is just more much more user-friendly for every 
end user that we have versus the other one, it's like you need to have somebody who really understands it. So you're trying to, all these different cameras, you're trying to connect into that Flock system eventually. Yes, and, and we have, like the city has Recore on their cars. Uh, I forget the company that uh, HR has. So, and these are all proprietary companies and they hold their technology pretty close to you. So for our purposes, we wish everything could come into one. And that's why we're looking at all different types of softwares. Well, that'll be a future presentation. Uh, that just brings all these the siloed data into one operational field, uh, but it's difficult. So um, a lot of times, the real-time crime center will be those super users that will be able to use multiple and give that real time. But right now, some of the separated stuff is not getting to us. So is that something that we need to be cognizant of, I think, as the county moving forward? Because we would want anything additional we're purchasing to make sure that it will feed into your system because that's how we provide additional safety to our staff and the citizens and all of that. So. I would say everybody does a pretty good job of communicating to us. I get emails from the chief or the under sheriffs and other lieutenants or other parts of the county that, hey, how does this fit in? Because this is now on people's minds. Uh, but ultimately, we're probably going to need to form a, a technology advisory committee that looks at, you know, siege security and um, how does it not just affect us but other parts because uh, sometimes there's really good intentions to bring in types of technology, but it may not fit. Um, and we, we do have some knowledge on what vendors are working well with others and which aren't. Um, Motorola is very prevalent with our partners in North Idaho and with private businesses around here, like uh, tow companies have cameras on them, uh, their tow trucks. Uh, some of the uh, garbage trucks uh, have great data that uh, we're not getting access to. One example is, I'm not sure if it was a tow truck or a or a garbage truck, but at 32nd and Pines, a stolen out of Arizona hit the system, but it hit over in Kootenai County because they have a Motorola system and we don't. Motorola is very expensive and it's a completely different vendor. And then they called us and we were able to go out and recover that vehicle. Uh, but we were relying on that partnerships with, with them just to notify us if that <coughs> answers the question. But yes, it's, it's important to just to kind of, there's a, a lot of details and specific software with if it's ingestible or not. I'm still learning it. Um, so we're excited. Uh, the most important uh, component of all this real-time crime center is the people working in it. Uh, and it it's going to be a really exciting job. We've got uh, offers out to two candidates. Uh, I would say we're preconditional, but hey, we're offering you the job initially to go through backgrounds, and we're hoping to bring them on in April. Uh, and We'll have them in a temporary spot down in Rig 9 before the construction is done upstairs. Um, and then we also have a third position that we plan on filling during uh, the summertime uh, as we vet our candidates. Um, want, to talk about, want to talk about who these specific are? One's from the county. Go ahead. One's an internal candidate from the county, and another one is from uh, 911, a supervisor on 911. So it's, it's pretty uh, experienced candidates that I think are going to hit the ground running. And, I'm losing one of my employees, but uh, I'm working on filling that. So, one of the few battles I won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, we're super excited. I think we got the right two candidates coming, and, and they're going to be really building this. They're going to be building SOPs, which, which also work closely into the the policy. Uh, we're working with our um, consultant right now to formulate those policies, which I've sat down and talked with you guys about, uh, and you know we're they're going to build the training program that they're going to get trained in with us, and they're gonna build the SOPs because there's it's unique how we run it here and, and there's not really a go by. So they'll have their hands full, but we should see uh, the wind skyrocket, I, I anticipate. Oh yeah, I, I think it was real important to bring them on during the development process as opposed to waiting maybe toward the end of the year when, when we had a seat for them to sit in and actually do this job, you know, in, in, the, in the updated real-time crime story, because this way they can develop it and they'll, they'll hit the ground running and, and they'll know everything about it and they can be trainers for the future too. Uh, we're bringing in a vendor from uh, Southern California with an established real-time crime center. Uh, they have their own business and they're going to teach our uh, tactical analysis class. We're, uh, we're funding uh, 15 seats in this class, uh, five from Shrek's dispatch, two from city dispatch. Uh, we've got two sergeants who are applying for our supervisor real-time crime center position. Uh, a few other people I believe have come to the class. Uh, Rig 9 personnel and our two candidates. 
for our first kind of established training class at the training center in April, April 4th and 5th. So uh, just ask records, it's been very loud in the public safety building with some construction, uh, but they're making uh, pretty quick progress. It's a 120 day contract. They're speaking like they're aiming for 90. Uh, so yeah, I'm about to show you a couple pictures that don't even replicate what it looks like this morning when I went up there, so go ahead. This is the old sergeant's office upstairs, right next to city roll call and across from uh, the gym, second floor, uh, and it's all getting gutted, new windows, and the video wall will go up on that far wall that you see right there. This is where all the stations will be, and in just a moment, you'll see the next slide will be a rendition of what that will look like from that point of view. All right, and we wrap up with some of our, just a few snippets of, of success stories. Um, we can only bring so many. Um, but real quick, I'll let Under Sheriff uh, Richie kind of talk about just our statistics up to date. So uh, as you can see, we've, you know, this, like I said, this has been going for about, this is about 14 months worth of data. Um, and, and this is just, you know, when they find time to be able to monitor this or, or when patrol gets the hit or whatever. but. You can see the, the success stories. There's 178 different success stories over this 14 months. 110 people charged or arrested. Uh, 208 criminal charges. 67 stolen vehicles recovered. And more, most importantly, I think two missing people were located. And go ahead, go ahead to the next one. This is the, yeah, this is, if you have your binoculars on, you can see this. But th these are all of the charges. Um, and. And if you go to the area, I'm sorry. Yeah, different, this is all this different NIBRS crime types yeah. that have, have been uh, detected or uh, affected by real-time crime. And go ahead to the next slide, and it kind of highlights, these are, you know, some of the very serious crimes. That you see the red right there, there's uh, two murder suspects. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, I can't even read it, but assault and carjacking. carjacking. These, these are all our, what yeah. we call our bark felonies, your burglaries, your assaults, your robbery, your arsons, uh, kidnapping, all that. The, the higher end uh, felony crimes that uh, we've been able to impact. And there's one, there's, a, I think it's up there, the attempted sexual assault that was solved by Liberty Lakes. In conjunction with Liberty Lakes yeah. cameras. They actually were able to get approval through their council before we were to get running, uh, but they got flocked with what we were bringing with the Real Time Crime Center. And then we had the hiker who was assaulted. And within hours, we had the suspect in custody because of that, of those. Uh, and this is from an unknown suspect. We had no idea this person was. It would have been a DNA case yeah. at best, we think. So again, the, the purpose of this ARPA project is for uh, community violence intervention. And here are your most violent crimes, which we're regularly impacting. So um, for the record, uh, Commissioner French has joined us. So I just want to make sure we know that. Um, and then, so of these statistics that you have, um, how many, I mean, is it, is it where you were able to, like in that case, actually find the person very quickly versus a DNA case would take months? If, if, if that person had DNA on file. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, it's. So, yeah, so I mean, so it's, it's, it's that you're able to do this in a faster time frame to, and it's keeping our community safer because we're. Well, and the, the Liberty, I, I bring the Liberty Lake case up because I, I think it's, I, I don't know where, where the stage of that uh, prosecution is, but. Um, that, that one's a pretty amazing one to me because this is a, this was a stranger assault on somebody and they had no idea who this person was and, and we may not have even collected any evidence from from the uh, case but they were able to solve it. It, it likely prevented future crimes because people who do this sort of thing don't just stop after one success you know they, 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 they learn and they grow and they move on and so who knows what would have happened with that case but we were able to catch a person when they were just barely starting out so. That was uh, that was, that one was pretty amazing, um, and there's been some other ones. A couple of the homicide cases, you know, they were able to solve in a matter of days as opposed to months. You know, waiting for data to come back and, and uh, evidence to be processed. So, and I've got a murder example. It's not in our list here. Uh, I'm sorry, in our in our slides. But uh, and just so you know, it, the license plate readers are not designed for capturing persons. But if 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 the camera is facing forward facing traffic and the sun's in their face. We might see somebody in there, but most of the time you'll see from, we don't yeah. get, it's not designed to pick that up, but it'll get people walking by, just incidental in the public, right? So Stevens County had a murder on the side of uh, the highway, I think just up in Suncrest. Uh, 
he was a, a beating. And they had, from what I remember, five or six potential suspects. Uh, and all they had was a, a red Honda with a partial plate. And they had numbers and letters out of order, potentially. Just the information on the plate, pulled up a plate, a vehicle, that vehicle at um, uh, Country Homes and Wall, happened to be driving into the sun. One of their five su suspects was clearly in the driver's seat. Luckily, he was already in custody in Spokane County Jail, uh, but it, it ruled out those other subjects and closed their case almost immediately just by having that one piece of evidence. And we don't know when that stuff's going to happen, but the mere presence of us to aid uh, closes that case for them. Uh, Commissioner Kearns, you would raise your hand. Uh, um, actually, I, I think you, you just answered my question. My, my, my question was, you know, yeah, is, is there the, the potential that you can you know, uh, identify an individual that just happens to be walking by, you know, not in a car, no license plate, anything like that, but just the, <laughs> the individual, could, you know, is, who's suspected of a crime walks past one of the cameras. But I think you, you, you just answered it. So, Well, I'm glad you asked that question because we have another example of that where it doesn't come up in our normal search, but every time it's got movement, it'll snap a picture. Uh, so if somebody's on a bike or walking by, yes, it'll snap a picture, but it's not like part of our view. The only time we see those when we have a specific crime and we're, uh, and we go search a specific time for an image. We, Wait, we don't know why this does this. I don't even know where it's at. It has a cut of my phone. Yeah. You guys help us out with this one. Maybe one of our animals. We don't know whose number this is. We have an IT manager. We'll set him up. So, does anybody remember the? We had a hit and run. Two pedestrians killed at uh, trails in, at Flint. Probably four or five months ago, out west. Okay. Uh, they were walking dark. They were walking eastbound. The vehicle came by and hit both of them and fled and killed them. Uh, by going back and searching, it saved images. And these images, uh, they get destroyed after 30 days. So we have that window to identify it. Uh, but looking at a specific time, we're able to see the two victims walking by. We're able to then, within the moment, see the suspect vehicle get their plate. And then the person who called it in was on a bike. We were able to get see them coming by. And we were able to identify two more witnesses vehicles that had good information that never called in. So we were able to contact them <coughs> and say, hey, you're in the area this time. And, oh, yeah, I saw this or this. So additional witnesses that we didn't know we had. Uh, and also corroborating the information and the plate on the vehicle that caused that. But... Again, that's stuff that we had based on a specific crime that occurred. We went back and found that. Uh, we're not searching persons walking by. We don't have that ability. I think that's the thing that's fascinating to me and, and great is that, I mean, you're really able to target who you really think it is instead of a general description and, and going and talking to a lot of people that fit that general description and, and all of that. And so it just, to me, that's, that's one of the things that I think is really great about the system right. uh, versus, you know, people feeling like they're targeted, you know, just because what you're describing leads to negative contacts with our officers. If we're stopping people that aren't involved, which leads to uh, potentially unnecessary uses of force or complaints uh, by, by doing, by doing this project, which we call precision policing, we can be more targeted and give better information uh, up front before we take action, which nowadays is extremely important. So. Like that. So precision policing is the term. Okay. Instead of casting an entire net, we can kind of just be surgical uh, with who we're contacting in the best case scenario. Yeah. And here's a good example of it. So uh, this is a good example of our layered technology where several things came into play. Pool World up on uh, Country Homes on March 9th of last year uh, was burglarized. Uh, I think it was a weekend. Uh, sus suspect is, we end up finding he's a prolific burglar breaks into the business, uh, computers and other items stolen. Uh, all we have is a surveillance uh, video of a red truck with a stolen cart from the business that he used to pack up all the stuff in the back of the truck. Uh, based on that, we might have put out like a picture in the Daily Flyer and said, hey, look for this truck, um, but because no plate was in there. So go ahead. And if you can press play on that. So without our layered real-time crime center technology, this is all we would have to go off of. So there's actually a sticker in that right rear window and you can see the green cart in the back of the truck and the crime just occurred, boom, that's it, all we have. Well, luckily down the road, we install license plate reader cameras, go ahead. 
Uh, go, go back to that word. Yeah. You can just write, go to the next one. Next slide? Yeah, yeah next slide. And then, go, yeah, so without having a plate, we can say we just want all the red pickups at the nearby cameras in this time frame, and this is what we got. So we blacked out the, the plate, but that, we now we have a plate. We can see the sticker in the window. We got the green cart. That's our suspect vehicle leaving the scene. Now we have a suspect, which leads to a warrant by detectives uh, on uh, the suspect's uh, phone, which showed him in the area of five different vehicle prowls and the burglary. Vehicle prowls we had no idea he was associated with. So we were able to clear out five additional crimes because of this progression of evidence and layered technology. Uh, and he's arrested uh, his future crimes, hopefully stopped until he got back out. Uh, and and uh, was, part of it's not, I don't think it's in here, is it goes out in the flyer. One of the deputies in the valley stops him, gets him in the vehicle. I remember, yeah, I remember gets this. Gets his phone. I think we yeah, talked yeah. about this one. Um, and it just, everything just played into uh, assisting in, in kind of solving this case. And what the prosecutor's office loves is this probably doesn't go to trial. I mean, this is an airtight case for as airtight as they probably get uh, and it, it maybe gets a better plea it saves time and money in the court process with better evidence etc there's the ripple effect just we can keep going on with the positives victims get maybe uh, closure a little bit sooner Good. Awesome. all right so uh, one of our violent crimes we had a shooting out uh, on West Mission east of Northern Quest Casino in the middle of the day if all we had was suspects fled in a GMC Yukon after a fight uh, in the shooting at Northern Quest. Uh, there happened to be a flock camera in their path. Uh, immediate search from one of our analysts who was monitoring this. Luckily, just happened. This happened during the day, so we had an analyst. And we had a success. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't. It probably wouldn't have helped without having somebody sit there. Uh, two su suspects were arrested because of uh, this. So go ahead. As you can see, there's kind of a map on the left is the casino, then there's the camera, and then the vehicle recovery uh, <coughs> scene over far right. Uh, they pulled up white Yukon and verified that that was a white Yukon that was then used in the shooting and then burned to burn all the evidence up shortly after, uh, I think it was two or three subjects were shot in that car. Uh, shooting happening inside the vehicle amongst the occupants. It was a robbery from uh, the casino. So. That evidence was uh, pretty much shored up. Um, last uh, example, I believe, is Stevens County, our partners to the north. Uh, you can go ahead and press play. Uh, they had a drive-by shooting, and you see the white avalanche that's pulling into the parking lot uh, beyond right there. These are cameras at uh, Car Wash Plaza, a third-party uh, Sentinel program partner. Uh, one officer, so this vehicle hit an LPR, which alerted the officer in the area. Uh, he finds it pulling into the Wandermere Car Wash Plaza. He's by himself. Our county deputies, often their backup is pretty far away. He's able to use the cameras here to keep a safe distance, keep an eye on the vehicle without having to confront them solo. So we saw this as a win, as a safety win for our officer uh, while he's trying to get other officers in the area. So they're all coming from pretty far away. He's got the video up on his uh, computer from Flock OS uh, from just a push button, and he's watching it. Uh, completely out of view. Uh, you can go on to the next video. It's going to take a moment. Ends up the shooter's not in the vehicle, but uh, two witnesses were witness passengers, and one of them had warrants. Uh, ultimately, I think they caught the subject who uh, did the carjacking in Stevens County. They'll get back in on it. We can fast forward a little bit as they start pulling out. Go about halfway. Yeah. So you'll see the other deputies who were responding to assist the solo officer uh, start to come into the area as they're leaving and they're able to effect a stop on them. What other further crimes or uh, and more importantly in the case, this happened right after the shooting. So the evidence is very fresh on this capture and assisting our partners. Uh, RIG-9 stands for regional. So we support our regional partners in the surrounding counties. As you see, those officers are there. Now we've got, hopefully, maybe it avoids a pursuit when only one deputy is trying to stop them versus you got four on scene. Kind of hinders uh, any resistance we <clears throat> potentially. So. Oh, 
Although this is the last one, I apologize. So this is just like a few weeks ago, Dustin Bonsgard, uh, one of our analysts, uh, goes out at 4 a.m. to put up a, we have portable license plate readers for targeted type of incidents. There's a construction site uh, down uh, south of the valley and the number of property crimes we have and being able to stop those are, are difficult. There's so many of them, we only have so many detectives. So um, this construction site's getting hit constantly, a bunch of building materials getting stolen. So at 4 a.m. he's down there, he's up on the stop sign putting the camera on and the suspect actually drives right into the scene while he's up there. He's able to get the plate, the guy freaks out, takes off. Based on getting the plate, this was a known suspect. With that put us into probable cause land, we were able to get, with our precision police, we were able to get the, uh, uh, a warrant uh, by the detectives for a GPS tracker on his car. Um, with the camera affixed there, uh, go ahead and go to the next one. We, there was additional construction burglaries between them. Um, he comes back to the scene when we're not there, but the camera's up. We get a photo of his vehicle and uh, <laughs> go into the next one. That's the last picture on that camera before the camera disappears. And luckily we've got GPS on the camera. We had GPS on his vehicle and the two dots stayed together until he got about stole the, the camera. Till he got to Sullivan Bridge and the camera disappeared, probably still on the bottom of the river. <laughs> so he's been charged with theft of the camera in addition to the burglaries. And you can go to the next uh, scene. We don't solve this case without this technology. Uh, $50,000 burglary, uh, the GPS tracker, because of uh, that first information, put him at a, a Deer Park burglary of, of a construction trailer. The tracker also, um, uh, Ultimately, the recovery of, of the stolen property ended up being about $100,000. He was actually a builder as well. He was stealing other companies' stuff and building, trying to build other uh, properties with all that stolen material. He would have kept doing it over and over again. So I think there's another line at the bottom. Is there? Oh, no, we got it. So that was kind of the last of our 178 success stories. That's just a snippet. And I assume I have some questions. I know a little bit about the construction theft that goes on <laughs> in this county. Right. It's pretty amazing how criminals know even just, I mean, I'm surprised they stole it instead of, like, a lot of them just get shot out, yep. you know, so the cameras can't continue to do anything, whether it's a paintball gun or a gun or all those kinds of things. It's we assume that he thought that the images were only physically held on the camera and not transmitted to us, so uh, he, was, he was caught red-handed before he committed the crime. Yeah. No, I can see, I mean, again, you know, especially construction sites are hit all the time. It's, it's just a constant um, battle. So um, just imagine in a few months when we have tactical analysts sitting in, in, in chairs watching this stuff and they're getting the hits and they're able to run, you know, cross check it with some other stuff going on and, and get this information out real time to deputies. Um, just imagine how many yeah. success stories we're going to have then. It, it's actually going to be so overwhelming, it may be hard to keep up with uh, tracking, you know, with, for the deputies out of the field trying to, like, find these people. So. Right. That, that would be part of my concern. So, so my other thought would be, like, the General Contractors Association, the home builders, you know, their cameras are moving from job site to job site. So is it something that if they're looking to purchase cameras, they can purchase cameras specific that would help feed into your system? Because um, I know that that's, that's a great question, and I think we can pose that to how can we connect uh, a business that's moving their cameras? I'm guessing they're going to have a centralized video management software or some sort of DVR or something that's moving with the and, and if that and if the gateway from Flock is connected to, to that, they can probably connect from anywhere. We would just need to make sure that the location's changed so we can see specifically where it's at. Uh, and if for purchasing cameras, they can anybody can purchase cameras from anywhere. I've had some feedback from. Uh, local business like why are you only offering flock and be like well we've been we brought flock in front of the board for two years now and everybody's had an opportunity to come, let us know what you have and we've we go to you know conferences and we find out where the best vendors but we can connect to any of them but they do offer a subscription camera that any business can well and i guess one one question is that are there cameras some cameras that are better than other cameras that that then would let construction companies or home builders or those kind of people know this would be the type to purchase versus something else that, you know, like an Arlo versus a Ring. 
Yeah, so, you know, whatever works for them best is first. And then we're working with um, a company called Wave. Uh, and, and generally, you have um, cameras from Canon, Axis, and then you've got other vendors. And, they, they, you know, some uh, are better quality than others, and the price is variable. But some of the features that we're going to have on the cameras we're deploying, uh, hopefully with some of the county parks and some of the intersections, um, you know, some of the ability to have a 360 camera plus a PTZ, so you have 360 all the time, and then you have a camera that you can manipulate and turn. In addition, these new cameras actually come with a microphone. It just survey knows not to record conversations, uh, but they pick up gunshots, breaking glass, screeching tires, screaming, and then the cameras will automatically go to that and then alert us if we have it set up through the, the video management system that way. So a lot of layers in place, but those are kind of the Cadillac cameras. But sometimes if somebody just has one fixed camera pointing the right way, We've had success with ring cameras, you know, yes. home ring cameras. Uh, it, Justin was telling me about a, an incident where the, the SWAT team was outside waiting for a barricaded suspect, and this person was violent. They were, you know, waiting for him to come out. Um, they were able to tap in with, through the permission of the homeowner, the ring camera inside, and they watched the guy building a fake gun. So he was just, he was making a fake gun, and he came out with that fake gun. Well, because they saw him do that, they knew it was a fake gun, and so they're able to use less than lethal <coughs> technology on him as opposed to lethal force. Probably saved his life because he would have come out; they would have thought it was a gun and, right. and taken appropriate action. So, um, it's that's. And they didn't even honestly when they when they first showed up, they didn't even know they had that kit. The detectives figured it out on the fly. They, they figured it out on the fly, and like, oh, heck, they we can see this real sense. So, it, yeah. it was all through drone sense. So, I mean, we were able to use all this different technology to solve these yeah. problems that we didn't know. We could so we're learning stuff as we go, even in the field. Um, and another thing that we, we didn't talk about in this presentation, I think is really important. Uh, we had all the uh, uh, school superintendents, uh, the, the, the ones we serve anyway with our SOD program. Uh, we had a meeting with them that we took them over and showed them the Real-Time Crime Center. And, and uh, most of the schools are, are joining in and uh, they have specific permissions. You know, we, have to, we, we can't view the cameras unless there's an emergency. And we have to you know, notify them why we need the cameras and that, kind of, that sort of thing. But um, the, the effect that it's going to have on school safety and being able to respond to uh, rapidly evolving violent situations, potentially violent situations, I think it's, it's, it's going to give us an edge in those, those type of you know, ordeals. And another thing it, it can do is it can detect things, you know, people coming into the parking lot. It can send them alerts showing them, like maybe they have someone who has a, a protection order, a restraining order, they can't be there. It'll alert when they show up there, that, that type of thing. So it's, we're, we're going to really affect school safety and, and the safety of the kids here. Uh, I think it's a real important thing that we, we didn't really yeah. cover here, but it's going to be huge. That will, I mean, seriously, no, that will be huge. Yeah, I mean, imagine if, you know, on any of these, these horrible situations where they've had active shooters in schools, if they were able to real time and have someone go in there and see what's going on in the classrooms in real time while we're responding. It's just, it's going to cut, you know, minutes off of these uh, horrible events. So until we get people sitting there, we have to, hopefully there's an analyst who understands how to use that system adequately, who can run over there and plug in and we're losing precious seconds, seconds and minutes. The first seconds and minutes is when we lose lives. Okay. Uh, and having somebody there is able to do it right away uh, is important. And, um, yeah, for school partnerships, are they primarily kind of, are they inside the building, the cameras, or are they just on the outside, or does it vary by school? So, uh, yes, we have, so each school has usually a different type of video management system, and through our IT department, we can log in individually. Uh, so they'll have cameras inside and outside, and we have MOUs in place that we only access during specific emergencies. However, we're in the process with East Valley and maybe Central Valley about working it to where all the external cameras for awareness uh, in the parking lots, et cetera, we can get real-time access. Maybe we don't need to have an emergency situation, but we're getting some sort of disturbance. For example, we had, well, this would have qualified for the emergency situation, but uh, when we had the school hoax, uh, vast hoaxes at all the, the shooting, we would have had the ability to plug right in and see that there was nobody coming in armed and that wasn't going on, which slows down the response and the initial effect on on people's psyche that they think there's and the parents responding there we can maybe get that information quick and go look we don't have evidence of that occurring right now uh, through having that direct connect but you, you can imagine the hundreds of parents who are panicking when this you know goes out they think there's and, and we can look and say nope it's not, it's not actually happening so. and with three people i'm going to try to staff 
the school hours as much as possible, but uh, we're also trying to match the activity of calls, which is later in the afternoon. So we'll probably have uh, two on swing shift and one day shift, but they're not going to be able to work every day of the of the week, right? So if this expands, one of my primary goals is to cover beginning to end of the school hours. We just won't we'll just be able to cover most of it initially. And the last thing that I think I wanted to leave uh, uh, with this group and, and so the community is aware and what we talk about and when we when we share this is there's a lot of very powerful tools in this real time prime center and that can cause some concern. It would cause concern for me, especially with a group or an agency that I don't trust to use that stuff. Uh, so uh, we believe we're going to protect that trust jealously uh, with our policies, with our actions, and just being real careful on how we're using that. Uh, just like, you know, with the fast cars and, and firearms that we're entrusted with, we're going to use this with the same amount of um, caution uh, and care with what, uh, how far we're going with all this technology. Thank you. It's exciting. You know, Way of doing things, um, you know, for Spokane County, and like I, you know, I think the precision policing, you know, just all those things, the, the, the safety of kids, I, you know, it's so important for our community. So I'm excited that we could use the ARP dollars to help get this up and going, and then it's figuring out how we how we continue it right. um, in the future, and and so you know what what grant opportunities are out there, and and you know even like you were saying your partnership with WSU if that happens. You know, uh, I just think all those things, you know, just make it better. So thank you. Yes, we're, we're definitely trying to prioritize what we can spend our current budget dollars on and some of the extra stuff like WSU. Uh, things become available. We're looking at grants right now uh, for some uh, uh, Homeland Security crime pro violence prevention and what opportunities. But some of those things we're able to do and some we're not. So it's, uh, hopefully we'll, we're aiming for mid-June for uh, ribbon cutting, hopefully. Yeah. We'll have another presentation for you uh, for the council or the, the commissioners uh, right before then, and then we're going to invite you guys to come, you know, sit in the crime center or the, the real time crime center and watch it and kind of see it up and running. So. Exciting. Be fun. Yep. Thanks for letting us take a huge chunk of time. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Good. I guess I want to stay for my <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate Cheers. it. today um, to find out if there is interest from the BOCC um, regarding um, a wellness option that we uh, have been um, asking if it would be good to offer our employees. Um, and so really wanted to chat through today um, a proposed workout area that we could make available to our staff in the event that this group would like us to move forward with developing a committee and doing the work to determine what that would look like. Um, very preliminary here today. I'm really just here to gauge interest and see if you guys would like uh, us to move forward with this um, proposal. Um, so what you have in front of you and what you have on the screen is the basement of the Public Works building. What you see in yellow right now is a large uh, file storage room that Public Works has been using for many years. Um, and they've been undergoing a huge digital digitization project um, to go paperless with a lot of their current and archive information. Um, they are at a point now where they have gotten everything off site. Um, they are still working on uh, removal of the many, many file cabinets and things like that through our standard process. Um, but as we see that space opening, um, the question uh, from some staff was, hey, have we ever considered a county um, fitness area for downtown campus employees that we could make available to staff? And so that's what I'm here to chat with you guys about today. Um, the area that you see in the red are existing locker rooms. There's men and women locker rooms. Uh, if you've never been in there, they're in desperate need of a facelift. 
especially the men's. I wouldn't recommend walking in there without some flip flops on your feet. Uh, <laughs> but it's you can just tell it's time, right? It's uh, they they need a, a some renovation. Um, currently, they're used by a handful of employees, uh, many of which bike to work or take uh, runs on their lunch break or things like that. Um, we do have a small set of lockers as well in each of those areas that are not managed by us at this point. People just use them as they're available. Um, and uh, that's where we're at existing with our locker rooms today. So uh, the questions um, that we've been getting and some suggestions for the last few years that I've even been here have been around, um, could we provide a fitness room uh, for employees similar to like what the city has or um, the state employee, uh, some of those locations or King County. Um, and so we do actually for the first time, probably in a long time, have an area that could potentially be utilized for that. It's a large space. Um, it's already located next to the locker rooms that are down there um, and uh, could really create uh, an area for Julie Tanani, who's a contractor we use for general wellness um, activities, um, to provide some space for her as well to be able to do the classes that she offers and the work that she does for us. So really looking at um, could could this be a space um, that we could look at? Um, and if so, putting together a committee who would then be responsible for actually digging into this work. Um, so looking at the space utilization itself, looking at what a locker room renovation might look like, um, what equipment purchase might look like, a maintenance plan, the employee risk plan, um, monthly membership for sustainability, if that is what they recommend, but really just putting together that recommendation as well as the financial assessment to then bring back to this group and um, get blessing on. Um, and so at this point, just for awareness of our current county wellness offerings, um, we do have, like I mentioned, Julie Tanani, who is a contractor who does um, some wellness um, activity for us. Uh, her contract includes two classes a month on campus. Um, wellness articles, so the wellness articles that you guys see in the county news flash, uh, those are written by Julie Tanani. Um, she also does body work, which I would say is probably significantly what she spends a lot of her time on, um, which has been incredibly helpful for our staff. It's uh, in my opinion, I think it's uh, helping our overall health costs as we're not seeing people end up needing to go to the PT or to doctors because she's able to help catch things early for them. She does things like taping, massage therapy, um, light PT, stretches, things like that that she's able to offer our staff, which has been really cool. I've had really good feedback on that. Um, and then she also um, is certified to do one-on-one -on -one coaching around just general um, wellness and health and uh, dietary needs and things like that. So um, that's something that we currently Currently offer to all of our county employees. Um, we also currently offer discounted gym memberships with the Spokane Fitness Center, the YMCA, and Move Fitness. Um, and then we also offer through our employee assistance program, Life Solutions. They have um, some cool tools and information specific to wellness, fitness, nutrition, and emotional well-being on their app. And then additionally, on the other side, when we talk wellness, uh, financial wellness, they also offer a lot of education around financial wellness um, and some discounts for financial wellness as well. So we don't have a broad reach of wellness at the county right now. Um, I'm told before I came to the county, before COVID, there was a wellness committee that essentially dissolved during COVID. Um, and they tried to do things like walk for wellness or weight loss challenges or kind of fun stuff like that. Um, there was a small dedicated group of staff that just really uh, kind of fizzled out during COVID. Um, I have one employee in the, the Spokane County Benefits Office, and she was responsible for all things benefits and wellness as we've moved um, to some other projects that I've had her working on, like around um, paperless and things like that. That hasn't been on the top list of her priority, which is why I would recommend if you guys want to go this direction, we establish a committee of people that are not just within HR, but that are other departments as well that have real interest in wellness. So looking at kind of relifting that up, we do have a few people who are incredibly passionate about fitness and have already raised their hand to say, hey, if and when uh, we are looking at putting a committee back together, if and when we ever get a gym, um, please tag us. We'd love to be part of this process. So definitely some interest if people have been bringing this forward. But before I tell a team to go divide and conquer, I wanted to find out if that's a direction that this board is willing for us to move with that location. So I 
just initial <coughs> thoughts on this um, is, I mean, I think we've always been trying to figure out what the other needs in the county are versus you know how high a priority is this. So I, I guess I would like to see if is there a survey that we can do that would go out to see what the potential use would be because I don't want to feel like it's just going to be for a few people. I, I need to feel like it's going to be for a lot of people um, for for it to be useful. And so, so those are kind of two of the things. And then, yeah, kind of how do we pay for it? Because I know, like, in the sheriff's department, my understanding is the um, their gym, you know, they have a gym and they're actually required to, to be in shape to, for their job. Um, but it's the deputies association that actually pays for the equipment. It's not the county that pays for the equipment. So... So those are some of the concerns, not concerns, some of the questions that I would have that I guess I'd want to get some answers to before we, you know, then task a committee. Because once you start to task a committee, I, I don't want people feeling like, oh, we run this committee and it's not going to go anywhere. So I want to make sure before we do that, we feel like it's going to go further. But that, those are my thoughts. Uh, Commissioner French. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, a wellness program for the county has been something that has been on the table for many, many years, probably going back to uh, uh, Commissioners uh, Richard and Milky. And so uh, but not only because it's um, uh, a good program for our employees, but it also, and I think uh, Ashley uh, talked about it, it helps to uh, uh, reduce our medical costs. And, and uh, so uh, you know, taking this next step, uh, I'm, I'm all in favor of it. Uh, the details of how we're going to pay for it and and uh, manage it, I think, is uh, uh, good work for our committee to look at. But uh, conceptually, I mean, I talked to the folks over at Vista and, and other uh, corporations in the area, and they've seen great benefits from having a wellness program and, and uh, have now evolved to where they can't imagine not having one. So, um, and I know that in, in the public works, when we first started to work with Ms. Uh, Tanani, she was able to keep people, especially during the trying times of the year. And this was one of the critical things uh, for our road crew in the winter months when they were working 12, 16, 20 hour shifts and uh, just physically worn out. Um, uh, Ms. Tanani was able to uh, uh, either tape, uh, uh, manipulate or give them exercises and stuff that allow them to uh, recover quicker, which means they were in the trucks faster, which means that we had more trucks on the road dealing with snow removal and stuff. So whether it's during the winter months or whether it's the summer months when we have folks working out on a road cruise and stuff, uh, those are uh, folks that uh, benefited from this as well as our sheriff deputies. So I know that I've had a number of sheriff deputies approach me about um, how, um, uh, how the program has worked for them in terms of keeping them on the job. So uh, I'm conceptually, I'm all in favor of moving forward uh, and would uh, certainly encourage a committee to start working out on the details to see how we can make this uh, uh, one of the many programs we provide for our employees. Thank you. Commissioner Kearns. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in and uh, and th throw my support behind the the concept. I know I th this is a, um, a a a topic that that I I know I I had discussed with our, our previous CEO um, several years ago. But at that time, the, the the big issue was we we didn't have this this vacant space. Um, so I, I I believe that this is a, a space that has recently been cleared out um so yeah they, it wasn't available a few years ago um wh when i first had floated the idea to the to the former ceo i think there's a benefit to it you know i'm i'm under no no illusion that every employee will use it will, will utilize it but uh i i think that it, it's certainly uh certainly likely that a large number of employees will um and it's just another another benefit that we would be offering to our employees so i mean i i think it, i think it's great when i when i used to work in the legislature they had um a, a workout room in the basement of the o'brien building and it was utilized by people you know all over the campus you know whether they worked in that in that specific building or not so i i think you know that these types of facilities do get used 
um, by, by, by a large number of folks. And as, as Ashley and Commissioner French stated, just the benefits of, uh, you know, of, of, of exercise, of, of having a, a robust health program, I, I, I think it's a good idea so to at least explore. So, and, and yes, I, I do have the, uh, certainly the same question you did, Commissioner Cuny, is, you know, where, how would, how would we fund this? Where would the dollars come from? You know, and so if, certainly it's all contingent on, on that question as well. But, um, you know, if, if we can take care of the, the dollar question, I think, uh, I think it's definitely a good, uh, a, a good endeavor to, to embark on. Chair, yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think that, to your point, we know that we have some spaces on the campus that people are working in that aren't ideal. And so, you know, to take this space and turn it into a, a, a fitness or wellness facility sounds great, but it might be good just to make sure we have buy-in from, um, from folks across campus. Because I do know we have some some buildings that people are working in that are not ideal so it would be good to know that they're bought into the, the, to this just knowing that we have to make some improvements across the campus to some of our buildings um, just for workspace so um, but I would love to have a facility um, and I do think that when you invest in wellness you definitely see a return in employee um, health, morale, um, lower health care costs. And so um, I think it would be good to shape, you know, if we're going to do this to shape um, and make the the work that this, this, I didn't know that this woman was even on the campus, that, that she was available to do. I know I've read, I've seen her articles, but you know, if we're going to uh, elevate that to some degree, that would be great. So maybe this is an opportunity to think about just elevating all of these pieces that have been happening and put it into a better package for the employees. If my wife is watching, if we get this exercise room, I'm definitely going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the thing to get my reg regimen going. Uh, no, I think it's. I, I think she'll let you home with the baby. Yeah. <laughs> or so that. Yeah. <laughs> Just say so that I've been waiting for this. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. I, I, I think a survey would be a good idea to see what the interest is from employees. I think that's good information. Uh, I think it's worth exploring. Same questions. What's the cost? Where's the, what's the revenue source? But I think it's let's look at it. Let's see what the employee interest is and see if there's a way to make it happen. To um, uh, Commissioner Walter's point about uh, space, um, I encourage you to go down and look at this space. There was a reason it was file storage space. There's no exterior windows. It's completely interior to the building. So it's, yes, can it be used for other reasons? Absolutely. Uh, but it's not, there's no ambient light coming in. So probably less than ideal for physical locations for employees and stuff to be at, but certainly um, but just good, important to good communicate that to, yeah. to folks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner I Hodge. agree. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, just a, a slight word of caution as, we, as we're trying to uh, uh, analyze costs. Uh, you also have to uh, include in that analysis, if that's what you're going to do, uh, the um, uh, avoided cost for injured employees and and how we either handle uh, overtime work, uh, you know, specifically uh, the winter months when we're trying to uh, plow streets or summer months when we're doing road construction and uh, somebody is just, you know, the, our, our workforce is getting older and uh and so uh taking care of them physically as well as mentally is uh, uh critical so if you're looking at the cost I, I i would hope that you would look at the total cost uh you know the impact on insurance uh and injuries and uh impact of of uh, folks not being able to work uh, and or not being able to return to work uh, for an extended period of time because we don't have a pro wilderness program in place so I think it's much more than just, you know, what's the cost of keeping the lights on? I think there's a, a, 
a cost to the entire system that we should be aware of. Thank you. Thank you. So my, yeah, I would I would agree with that as well. You know that that's definitely part of the and, and what we need to analyze. Um, and then thinking of that, Commissioner French, that makes me think: what happens if somebody gets hurt while they're working out? Is that our responsibility? Is that their responsibility? You know, so those things with risk management would be other. yeah. That's part of the committee like that I would want them to map out. So um, I definitely hear what you guys are saying. My ask would be, though, that I'm able to put a committee together, even small scale, because my team and I don't have the capacity to manage another survey, to manage another event. To, like, it's it's a lot. And when you have one person responsible for all benefits at the county that's all, and all leave management. So let's also dovetail that. And Jamie does all leave management and all benefits. So this committee would allow for us to do exactly what you're asking. I hear what you're saying, not wanting to get the cart ahead of the horse. But in order to do these things that we haven't been able to do, I need a group of people that's able to lean into this that has a little bit of capacity that can help with that, that can put, write a survey, use a survey monkey, gather the data. I, full disclosure, I don't have the capacity to do this myself, nor does Jamie Burchett. And so that's why that ask is, can we at least get a committee going and then be able to look at that, bring that recommend, and we could even interim step that, let's bring that back, then get the green light if you guys are then ready for us to look at a gym, however that needs to look. But I, I would ask for the ability to establish a small committee that can help do this work. Yeah, I mean, I'd be in favor of a small committee. I, I just, in the past we've had these people do these committee assignments and work and then nothing happens from it. And that's that's what I don't want because that's that's not a good feeling for those employees. And so I want to make sure that people feel that they're being empowered when when we do put a committee together. So I I'd, I'd be okay with a smaller committee to try to, you know, get the survey, you know, to really see because I think that's what you know, we need to you know, part of my decision would be, you know, seeing what people's uh, thoughts are on. Are you guys okay with the small committee moving forward? Yeah, all good. Okay, cool. there you go. All right, thank, thank you. you. We got to get our, a chance for our employees to be the one who are who are creating the, yeah, the buy-in and the grassroots sort of effort. They can do yeah. the outreach and empower them. That's good idea too. Thank you. So that is the end of our uh, agenda for today. A little bit longer. Um, is there any miscellaneous items? that anyone wants to bring up? I've okay. got a quick one. Okay, and I have one. Um, so do we have a new purchasing director? I, I'm hearing from Yes, yeah, yeah, we uh, we announced that. You may not have been here. Yeah, I may not yeah. have been here, we so. Have, we, I think uh, Randy announced that the week before. Okay. A week from, oh, there it is. Week from Monday. Monday. <laughs> okay. Her name is Melissa. Melissa. Melanie. Or Melanie. Oh my gosh. Melanie. I'm sorry, Melanie. I, didn't I said name. Melissa last time. You so did. She corrected me. It's in my brain. Okay. Melanie Dickinson, uh, she starts next Monday. So I'll bring her in here on Tuesday for you to meet her. She'll be at HR all day Monday, or most of the day on Monday, uh, doing orientations. Okay. Perfect. And where's she from? City of. Is it Evanson or Everson? Everson. Everson? That's in what? Uh, she basically does everything at the city. She is the finance director and the clerk, but she does all purchasing. She opens all bids. She has a wide plethora of responsibilities and knowledge. Just They just do things with fewer zeros. Okay, very good. Thank you. And, uh, had a, oh, and I, as I told the other commissioners, the interview team was under Sheriff Ritchie and also. Uh, that was myself, Kyle Tuhig, Sheriff Ritchie, or under Sheriff Ritchie. Yeah. Ritchie. So, Kyle and uh, under Sheriff Ritchie, they're the biggest, largest using departments of purchasing, which is why we had them in. It was their pick also for the. Great. Okay. okay. Exciting. Um, Kind of back to a budget item. The uh, if you recall, the sports commission had come in during budget and made a request. Uh, they had been funded uh, for annual support of two hundred twenty thousand dollars in two thousand twenty-three. They came in and asked for an increase to four hundred thousand, and also support for the cross course. I don't want to say that amount was in the vicinity of three hundred. 
thirty-two thousand dollars. Um, whatever was left in the account. Whatever was left, yes, they had asked for it. I believe. Um, there was no commitment made by the commissioners. Yep. There was a request to um, get their annual um, uh, reports, their annual financial statements, to see where else the funding comes from, which they provided that. So they're at there. Was, so then the commissioner did have some discussion, possibly um, keeping the funding level at two twenty. But you didn't take any action in the budget. We've got capacity in that. So they've been at, they've, they're asking for an update. Um, so I want to put out to the commissioners, do you want to have them come back in? Do you want to contemplate and, and bring forth some different level um, for them for next year? So I would, I mean, I think part of the, the conversation at that point in time was, uh, you know, we didn't have other needs for those funds, you know, with parks and what's happening in the West Plains Park and, and different things that are happening where we're constructing new stuff that we actually have needs for, for some of those, you know, that benefits the entire community as well. Um, and, and so I think we need to look at what those other opportunities are. Um, and then my question back to the sports commission is how are they spending those dollars? Like, not just their financials, but really having a, a discussion on what are you know what is the real need for this? I mean, you're you know what what are you really doing with those dollars? That's you know helping our entire community, you know, versus if we use some of those to help get some equipment out at um, the the new West Plains Park that we're scaling back because we don't have funds for. It. Um, is this the time to use some of those dollars to make that happen? Um, for us, you know, and, and to really get the West Plains Park where it should be, um, and then as we have future revenues come in, then to to help other entities. Um, I think I think sometimes we're so good about helping all the other entities that we kind of neglect ourselves um, in some of these situations. Like I said, I don't think we had the opportunities that we do right now uh, to use some of those dollars for what they're meant for. Yeah, and plans for you. In addition, the West Plains Park plans for is also one that we know there's, depending on how, how far we you, the commission decide to go, um, is a pretty substantial investment. Uh, Commissioner Waldrop and then Commissioner French. So, thank you, Madam Chair. So can you remind me, did we decide, though, to invest in the new cross-country course? We did. Okay, because I remember that there was a time-sensitive need around um, they are hoping to prepare that course in time to bid for a future like national cross country meet. Um, so, I mean, to me, I remember the conversation that that was something of interest to the commission because it would be developing something that would be uh, regional that would be um, bringing in a lot of uh, heads and beds uh, for the future as well as a course that could be used by our local teams. So I, I don't know if we need to circle back on, is that what they're most interested in? Or are they most interested in the ongoing, just operating support? There's nothing clarifying. It was just both asks. Okay, and, that was just and an I email. I do think that they got funding. I know they went after state funding, capital funding. I don't know. Because I think it would be good to circle back and find out, because they, they had some other asks out for that cross country course. and. I know the city of the valley was look, looking at supporting it, so maybe we can get an update on where they are with their goal to um, to finance that. Which I think that's an important piece because I, I think when they just were saying, "Oh, here's your balance, and we want all the balance," that's that's not a good ask. Yeah. That's that's not informing us. That's just saying that we think we got you've got a pot of money that we can use. And and again, I think we've got to be purposeful. So, yeah. Commissioner French. Sure, that's what I'm most interested in. Like. Where are they at with that goal of building that facility? And you know, could we contribute to that? Not just like what's left, but like what's left that they need to raise that we could help contribute to that. That's that would be my interest. Commissioner French. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to echo your comments. I, I agree with you hundred percent. The uh, investing into uh, hard assets and our parks and stuff is gonna serve our our community and our taxpayers and citizens for years where investing into a single event is is not going to do as much and stuff. So I would, uh, I, 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 
my memory is similar to yours in terms of how we came to that decision. And uh, uh, now knowing more information, I, I would rather see that money go into hard assets like the park. Thank you. Commissioner Kearns. Yeah, I, uh, if if my memory serves me correct, I believe that I mean, to to what Commissioner Waldrop was was also stating was we, I, I if I remember, I thought there was support of the board to um, to put some dollars towards the cross country track, but the the additional operating dollars for Spokane Sports was was what we we weren't sure about. We wanted sort of additional to to your point. We wanted additional information on sort of you know had they brought on additional uh staff you know how those additional dollars were to be used were they were they uh, event specific were they marketing were they you know what was you know how exactly those were going to be going to be spent but um i yeah I, I think it'd be good to get a rundown you know did they get dollars from the state for the track you know what? What what is the delta they need, or do they have the dollars now? Because because I think when when they asked us, that they did also have an ask to the city of the Spokane Valley, and I think they were they may have also been. I I think I may have heard they were also going to be asking Liberty Lake to maybe put in because the this the this cross country course would be sort of what I think they were they were selling it as a regional asset to bring in events, but I mean I. I'd still be open to to funding the cross country course, you know, as a one time expense. But uh, I would certainly need to hear a little more information on how they'd spend the other dollars if they're looking at us to increase their their, their operating expenses. Yeah, no, I would agree. Thank you. Um, and I think, you know, the cross country course is actually going to be owned by the city of Spokane Valley, so it's it's their course. They're asking other people to participate in the regional nature of it. Um, and I think the Sports Commission may be trying to do the outreach for it. I, I don't know. But yeah, I, you know, I, I'm happy to, to look at, yes, some of the one, a one time fund to help contribute to it. But, but we also have our own needs that we haven't looked at, um, you know, and haven't had in the past. You know, so um, so I, got, I think we got to look at the whole picture. So could I follow up on that, Madam Chair? So the so for the West Plains, I know there was a delta of what we would love to do to really fully um, have all the amenities there. So do we would would some of these dollars actually be enough to, to make well, a difference? That's what we need to find out. Okay, so Commissioner French. Yeah, I, and you know, just wanted to, to to remind the board that the the investment in the West Plains uh, uh, Park is uh, uh, you know a requirement to comply with their own comprehensive land use plan with regard to uh, uh, parks per population. And so, um, you know, we're not doing this just because it's a want. We're doing this because we've got to satisfy our own level of service with regard to uh, parks and community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Scott. So. Um, Maybe I'll propose that um, we bring forward in a subsequent meeting the um, car rental tax uh, fund that shows kind of where we ended for this sh last year, 23, what we're forecasted to um, collect in 2024, and what the board's committed dollars are. So you can see what the availability of it is. We can also uh, uh, bring up the uh, West Plains Park to see, because I know we do have a delta, and I don't know what it is off top of it. I had Commissioner Waldruff and also Plants Ferry and Cross Course that you could kind of evaluate it as a whole. Does that sound good? Yeah. Do you think like two weeks from now? Yeah, easily. Or yeah. The next, another strategic planning meeting? That'd be a good one. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Uh, we do have two exact we session items, exact session. but <laughs> they can go today or tomorrow. I don't think there's anything. I've got one for this morning. You've got one for this morning. I'd say, are people available just to get it done today? Commissioner Kurtz, Commissioner French, are you available to hang out a little while longer for executive session? I have probably got about 30 minutes and then I've got a hard stop, so. Okay, okay. and then Commissioner Jordan has a miscellaneous. No, I'm good. I was just agreeing with the time frame. 
Okay, got a half hour. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, so what can we accomplish in a half hour? An executive session. Uh, I've got um, one under real estate. Okay, uh, one under uh, acquisition lease lease real estate RCW forty two thirty one ten one B. Uh, it'll be the um, addition of the commissioners, Chris Anderson, myself, Randy Bischoff, and uh, Jeff uh, McMorris. And 10 minutes is no action. Okay. And I've got one under pending potential litigation pursuant to RCW 4231101I. Uh, that one should be the board, myself, and Scott Simmons. Uh, it should be about 10 minutes and no action. Okay. And the other longer one we'll do tomorrow. So we will do two executive sessions today. Each of must be 10 minutes um, for the purposes of just stated with the people that they just stated. Um, so it is now 1032. We're going to go into executive session for 20 minutes. Uh, with no action being taken, we will then adjourn for the morning and see everybody back tomorrow morning. Thank you all very much.